Good evening. My name is Alessandra Moctezuma and I'm gallery director here and professor of museum studies. And th thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, so I asked Nate to, to speak today. Uh, we just uh, opened our faculty exhibition and we have that exhibition every couple of years. And it's an opportunity for our students to see the work that's produced by their professors. I know students always ask me, what kind of work do you do? What kind of so this is your chance to see some examples from your instructors. And um, if you've been to the show, you see that there's a wide range of media. And we have people who are working in, uh, I guess what you would say, more traditional craft, uh, in painting, in drawing, in sculpture, in, and, and in terms of ceramics, you have some artists, artists some instructors, who work with the idea of the vessel. And then you have other instructors who are uh, maybe pushing the media in, in different ways. And um, Nate's piece in the exhibit is that beautiful accordion. And when you look at it, you know, think, oh, found object, this accordion. And there's a whole tradition since Marcel Duchamp of this idea of the found object. But um, when you look at it more closely, you'll see that it's actually partly a portion of it is made out of, of, of clay. So Nate is manipulating this idea of, the, of, of what seems to be the found object, but actually uh, it's something that he has crafted very carefully. And so I thought it would be uh, great uh, to have him talk a little bit about his, his work and inspire his, his students. I, I hope that some of them are here today. And, um, just thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, Nate? Uh, thanks, Alessandra, too, for putting together a really good show. It's always nice to see what people are making. Um, so I'm going to show kind of a variety of work today, um, but mostly I'm going to stay within the kind of ceramic bubble. I'm kind of as, as ceramic as I get, I guess, is what I'm going to go to. Um, a lot of what I do, and she kind of touched upon a lot of kind of where I bounce, but I'll paint and I'll do a lot of uh, mixed media and sculpture. Um, I teach mostly ceramics here. Um, this semester I have four classes, and that's kind of my main, I guess, grouping of, of knowledge as far as what I, what I know. But um, I really tend to bounce around quite a bit. Um, I find, and I'm, I'm, I'll probably get into this a little bit more later on, but I find ceramics to be just a really uh, usable material and medium for me. Um, it can be made into almost anything. It can be made to look like almost anything. And it has a lot of the properties that I want to kind of get across as far as my content goes. So um, I do use it a lot. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to kind of stick to here. There's obviously a lot of big gaps and um, time periods missing and stuff like that. So um, we're going to try this out. I'm also trying a lot of new new slides today, and so we'll see how this this goes. Uh, this this piece I'm starting out with is just kind of a little bit of a background for me uh, to talk about um, where I came from and how I got interested in this. Um, I really started out kind of uh, excited about throwing. I think a lot of people get into ceramics for that same reason, but I I kind of delved into the idea that I really wanted to work with the wheel, and I. I remember asking uh, my parents when I was a little kid for um, clay or at, for ceramics. My, I didn't use the word ceramics. I said, you know, sticky stuff in the ground. But um, they ended up buying me a block of clay and some tools. And I, you know, tapped on it for like 10 minutes. And then I, I thought, well, this kind of sucks. And <laughs> put it aside. And what I really wanted to do was the wheel. You know, I'd seen a picture of it or seen somebody doing it somewhere. and I. I was thinking, that looks awesome. Um, I wanted to sit on it, I think, and <laughs> twirl around, do stuff like that. But you know, I didn't know how to portray that. So later on, once, once I got into high school and um, even a little bit younger, I was, that's where I went. After school, just constantly in the studio. Ceramics, but also sculpture. And I got um, into a lot of things. And actually, I, I earned my first grant when I was a senior in high school to build this big piece. And I didn't include it. but. This is from my undergraduate um, early on, and uh, I was really just trying to push the idea of this of my skills. And um, a lot of what ceramics is is, well, depending on where you're at, and it's so broad right now. But 
um, is skill work. Um, a lot of it is knowing how to manipulate the clay to do what you want it to do. And those who have had it know really how difficult it is. It, it doesn't want to do what you want to do most of the time. So, um, <clears throat> you know, throwing at a very small base and kind of blowing these things out into this uh, hot air balloon shape and lit it form and under control. Also experimenting with a lot of glazes. I was interested in the technical side and as I kind of got older that became less and less of an interest. Um, but uh, this has a wood ash glaze on, on it and, and the wood, for those who don't know, we fire quite high and actually the wood um, ash melts into a glaze itself. So uh, I was using that as, as something. And this thing's about, I don't know, 21 inches or so. Um, very quickly, I think, as I kind of started moving out of the throwing and into more hand building. And these two pieces are really important transitional work for me. Um, you can see where I just started literally kind of tearing at these pots I was throwing and kind of upset and I came to the conclusion that you know a lot of people can throw really well and that's kind of the curse I think or one of the curses of ceramics is a lot of people can do a lot of things a lot of really cool things but so what you know what now what, what are you gonna do with it and uh, one of my professors said that it was like a critique and I was really excited about this new pot that I'd thrown he said so what he said, watch this, and he went, whoop, and threw something very similar. I was like, hmm. Okay, good, good, good point. So, um, so I started tearing at these, and I started really getting into molds. Um, for some reason, molds interested me, and I, so I started making a lot, um, and kind of in this frozen time, too, this idea of almost a, a still image of something in motion. And I like the idea of freezing time. Um, <clears throat> Everything seems very active in ceramics. You're constantly doing something, and I like the frozenness of, of this clay. And also, the clay is very permanent. It's very hard, and it lasts forever. And as I go through this, I've always kind of felt that that's part of my draw away from clay. I feel like that's the other kind of curse of clay, is that it does last forever, and it's, it's permanent. And I think that's actually a drawback um, for me. I like things that are kind of a little bit more impermanent, or I... I guess I'm drawn towards those, thing, those things a little bit more, but <clears throat> so I got I got fairly good at these as well, just molds and molds and hundreds of molds. And, you know, I kind of get um, crazy on some things. Just that knot mold alone on the end, I think it was a 11 piece mold, because it had all these weird angles and stuff like that. So I've started getting into the idea of a little bit of the Trump Floyd idea, where I'm replicating something else and making it appear to be something um, that it's not. So this is uh, all clay but rope, you know, and kind of this bent steel idea. Um, and just kind of playing with it, seeing what it can do. And this piece is about, um, about 23 inches across. And there's actually a rope on the back side that goes into the wall. The rope is actually cast. I take a plaster mold. Um, and the, you can't have any undercuts on the molds, and that's kind of the one trick part about it. But uh, then you, you fill it back in with a uh, slip, which is watered down clay. And the plaster actually sucks the moisture out and builds up a, a clay wall and then when you get it to the thickness you want you dump it out all the excess from the inside and you have a hollow uh, whatever it is you made a mold of um, and I like the idea of molds I like the idea of um, showing molds and making anything really replicating anything you can think about the problem with molds is that you know where I guess the problems in clay is that the piece shrinks so if you take a mold of something clay shrinks and you end up with something 10 12 13% smaller than, than the original piece. And uh, sometimes that became problematic, but not with this one. Again, kind of sticking with some rope. Uh, and I liked, I liked at the time tricking people. Uh, I liked people to kind of discover uh, what was going on with these. And at the same time, I kind of was always um, interested in a lot of uh, stories that I had always read. Um, this is on the wall, of course. And so I started to get into this, uh, this idea of actually getting across a little bit of content. Um, you know, where, where am I going with this? And it was all kind of building up to this idea of portraying um, an idea or a story. And that's where this kind of started. Um, this story is about a, a, actually several Makiliodora factories along the border um, dumping a bunch of toxic waste into uh, the Tijuana River and um, actually killing a lot of people on the Tijuana side and uh, most of the stories that I kind of discovered you know or researched I should say uh, are really under the radar 
they're not really that well known. Every now and then somebody's like, oh yeah, I know about that. For the most part though, they're not. And so these were kind of the things that interested me and I was kind of wondering, why, why haven't I heard about this, this story? You know, unless I have to go really educate myself. Um, so uh, one of these was from Tijuana and these are all manhole covers and one was from San Diego then one just says sewer and it's kind of the deteriorating one. Still kind of playing with the idea of uh, tricking the eye, kind of making these real corroded glazes. And this was also a real turning point for me, and this, is, this piece went along with that last one. And so I started actually combining several pieces together, and I would almost have, I wouldn't call it an installation because it could be seen anywhere, it's not uh, site specific, but it, they did go together, so you would kind of go from one piece to the next, discovering bits of the story. And sometimes the way I kind of saw it was that you had this puzzle, and you needed several pieces to actually see the final picture. And one piece of the puzzle alone could be very interesting, but all of them together, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't see it until they were all together. So this, you know, hopefully kind of carried some weight by itself, um, but with others it kind of made a little more sense. So these were some of the products that the factories made. And again, these are all molds. Um, and some of them I left, like this one you might be able to see, I kind of left some of the skin of the mold on there. Because I felt, you know, the factory, I want to get that idea of the factory across. I don't want to um, necessarily trick anybody. And, and there's another big turning point for me in this piece is that I started to leave things white. And uh, this piece specifically um, talked about a bunch of death, you know, the, the storyline here. So I started thinking, you know, I really liked the ghostly quality of the clay before I started to... Uh, uh, glaze it and it kind of got across this little bit more eerie feeling than when it was glazed then it becomes you know just a glaze such and such I included this kind of to show you that idea of a white bone and I found it very close um, so it kind of represents death for me um, a way of connecting to something a little bit darker in content maybe and also to um, get across the idea that it is clay and I started to discover that when people saw some, saw some of the work that was glazed, like that uh, pipe that was being bent with the rope, now it's like, wow, cool, it's rope bending pipe and it's, it's clay, you know, whoa. And, but that was about it, you know, and it be, kind of became this one-liner. And I kind of wanted, I was, you know, thinking, well, I have a lot more there, but people just weren't willing to go to discover that stuff. Also, I find that when you give that one-liner, um, people become disinterested. And this is a lot of kind of what I'm telling my students is, you know, think about how you can draw that viewer in longer, get a, get a, get a longer engagement of them. And so I think the white kind of does that. Um, a lot of people think it's spray painted or, or just painted white. And that's okay too, I think. I mean, the content's still brought in there. But with this piece, a bunch of pickaxes and shovels, and this story's about the Ludlow Massacre. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, it's about this coal mining factory in, in Colorado around the uh, turn of uh, the century. Uh, I think actually about 1912, I think is when it took place. And the story really is about these uh, focuses on these 11 people that were killed um, in this mining town. And just, just an example of one of the stories, uh, and I won't go into all of them, but this one in particular I really enjoyed um, making in conjunction with the uh, story. And this was the sole piece for the story, but uh, this mining town ran this, this colony. So they hired the people to work in the mines, but they also owned the store and the tents that they lived in and everything. So they're putting all of their money back into the company that they're earning. And so all of the miners started to protest and uh, picket. Well, the company hired these, these uh, people to break the picket lines and come in and this big feud started. Um, a few of the, the picket line um, breakers were killed, and then a few of the miners were killed, and then all of a sudden the, the um, mining company called in a militia, um, or actually government um, soldiers, to come into the mining town and take care of the problem. And what they did was they opened fire on this, on this campground, on this colony, and then lit fire to the tents. And you can see the tents that they lived in back here um, and this is a, a kind of a common family that would be there and they'd be there for years years working in this place I love this outfit too 
<laughs> trying to get my mom to make one of those for my baby. I'm also trying to get that hat. I think I could grow the mustache. Here's a picture of the colony. Uh, kind of a, one of them, actually. Here's some of the people hired to come in and kind of take care of the business. And then here's more of a soldier type um, with a gun. And this is a brand new gun that just come out on the market. This idea of a machine gun. It's funny that, you know, well, let's maybe try this thing out and see how it goes. They lit fire to the, to the colonies, and you can see, I mean, they just burn it to the ground. Well, this, these 11 people, they, what a lot of the colony people had done is dug tunnels underneath their, their tents to open up their li living space. And uh, just from lack of oxygen, they, they all died. It was two, two mothers, and there were um, nine kids in there. And so it became kind of known as this story of the Ludlow Massacre. And, um, so I started really combining. There's 11 pickaxes and shovels. Uh, all white, you know, kind of representing on this little bed of coal with some gas cans. and So I'm using other materials now to get, how do I get this story across? Here's another one um, kind of about the Maquiliadora factories. Um, I just kind of went with that same tire idea. Uh, this is, I don't know, seven feet, eight feet high. Um, and I, I stenciled real lightly uh, the chemicals that were dumped into the stream or the river, and I put them on real lightly so you kind of have to strain your eyes to kind of see what it is, kind of like the story. And that's part of my big question is how much do I give the viewer of the story and how much do I let them discover? I mean, why, why would I do this? Why not, write, why not write the story and hand it out? Why do a visual context at all? And so the way I kind of see these is as a, um, maybe a, a, a poem is written where you have to, you can read the poem, you know, if you just read it, I, I don't really know what that was about at all. But as you dissect the sentences, as you look to the words and kind of look the definitions of the words up, this thing kind of starts coming to life. Well, I think when people take the time, they can kind of come up to their own conclusions with these stories. And I like that part of it. I kind of felt that, it, you know, a lot of times when you put it out there, how are you going to know everybody's going to get what you want to get? Unless you're making a bowl, you know. <laughs> and even then. Uh, this is another story um, about this guy who worked in uh, a meat meat packing industry and just kind of his life. And this was probably my biggest piece in involving um, more, the most pieces together in combination. And this was kind of titled his childhood or the childhood. So I did give a little hint by saying, you know, the childhood, referencing him as a kid, um, work living with cattle and raising cattle. Here's a detail. Again, all slip casts and slip casts and rubber gloves. But I, I was still including the rubber nipple. So it's actually the rubber nipple. And probably from here on out, everything that's white is clay. Everything that's not is not clay. <clears throat> I also felt by leaving, the, leaving some of the original product, like the rubber nipples, it was a way for the viewer to, to connect to um, a time period that was now. Not necessarily just the past, but also the, the present, if that makes sense. Um, this is a story, or this, these go in conjunction with that. This is one piece. Um, this is called the cleanup. One of his jobs in the factory was to clean and hose down using some chemicals. He had a wielding knife job where he would wield these knives and recondition them. Um, really a horrific story um, about this guy. This kind of thing after thing. And what I did was I, these are clay, these are the knife parts and the pieces in it, and these are wood. And uh, I encapsulated all of them in lard. So I melted down lard and poured these little sections of lard. So it was really great that, you know, they smelt like lard. And I had a lot of people touching them. And it would like, you know, they get lard on their hands. <laughs> but it's a typeset box. I just really like the way that this was framed. There's another piece that went in with the show. Uh, my, the poles and all of this are, are clay, so this is an actual mop. And I went and got 20, 20 gallons of cow blood and put that in there. And uh, that really stunk too. It was really nice that it, uh, when he walked in the gallery, he instantly smelt it, and that was a whole new level for me. So, uh, one last piece about it. 
This is about 16 feet long, I think. Got some uh, stainless steel. I like the idea of taking something out of um, its original place, for instance, maybe in this uh, killing level of uh, a factory, and then bringing it into the gallery. So that included the backdrop, whatever, the tools, the boots and the gloves and all of that, and bringing it in. And then this is kind of a little bit newer work, and um, I'm going to include a few earlier shots of uh, these accordions. I recently did a, a series, and one of them is in the show. Um, but I started kind of breaking away from the story, and this is a really big, another big turning point for me that I, I feel. And uh, I have a hard time being comfortable, I, I feel like. I, I, once I figure something out, I got to move on. And it's kind of a curse more than anything else because um, I never really get anything. I never really figure anything out, I guess. But um, plus I like being challenged. You know, once I figured, well, you know, I can kind of do this. What else can't I do? And let's, let's try that. So technically, too, I, I find them to be a challenging. Um, I also stopped making uh, molds of things. Um, so this is a, a first of the series. And I did a different accordion. Um, there's a lot of different accordions out there for, for, for those who don't know. And I started really focusing in on the object. And this is a big big turning point for me about it became more about the object itself than the actual story yeah did you play accordion is that your draw to it or is it just something that fascinated you yeah I don't I don't play the accordion <laughs> uh, in fact I don't play anything it's, I'm a music don't um, but I was fascinated by them but not just any any of them it was certain kinds and I had kind of been collecting a lot of things throughout throughout well as far as I can remember um, as being serious about this and Actually, my wife kind of brought up an interesting point to me. We, I, I go to the swap meet a lot, and I go all sorts of places like that. But I was walking through, and I would pick this old tool up, you know, and I'd be like, look at this thing. You know, what do you think it's for? And I'd be like trying to do things, and she's like, I don't care. Uh, it does not interest me. And I'm thinking, um, she says, you know, I, I, it's almost like you have to validate this object. Like you have to somehow give... give uh, a love that this thing was once used and, and made by something or someone. And it became a really interesting point for me actually because I started thinking about that, that it is really about that for me. Um, that these things were handmade, you know, and, and this, this according right here, is, uh, or both of these, they're roughly around from 1870. And this is really the first style of accordion um, that was made. Uh, both of these are from Italy. and. Um, well, I, I can continue on about the objects, but uh, it really, it, it became more about not so much giving the viewer the story, or even really caring if they got it, but um, I don't even know the story of these. But I like that about it. I know that there is a story there. Like, how many hands have these gone through, and who has played it? And the person that made it really made one at a time. So most of the work that I'm kind of interested in now is kind of pre-assembly line, pre-plastics. Um, 1907 roughly for plastics but uh, you know kind of around that time before they took off <clears throat> wood leather and these things are also non-permanent you know the, the billows most of them are kind of torn some aren't but the wood often is chipped um, pieces are missing I love that aspect about it in fact the more of that the better I don't want these things to be perfect in fact if you look at the one in the show you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's perfect. Well, it's comparatively to where I was, it's not. It's, it's uh, got a lot of faults <laughs> to me. But, um, so the imperfect part of this is, is also a part. This is the one on the show, obviously. Um, but I have shown this a different way, and, it, and it's interesting, the different, the different uh, perspectives of this. This one's up, and it, again, it's kind of that stopped in, in time take, where this one, same piece, just a little different coloring, I guess. Um, is more s just set down. It's kind of dead. The motion is dead. There's really no life in it. Um, and I like that kind of uh, change. Most of the time I show it up. Um, sometimes I show it down um, just to see if anybody feels any different about, about these. Another one, four-sided. 
Uh, this one's probably, I don't know, I think it's about 26 inches long. Um, the one in the show I have underglaze on, but that's it. I don't use any other glazes usually. I want to keep a matte, and I don't want to keep, um, with the exception of this last one, this is the only gloss one, glossy one I've ever made, and um, I, it's kind of a mistake. But, you know, what do you do? I don't show that one anymore. <laughs> this is the biggest one, and, the, and yeah, they're all slab built. Um, I can't make a mold of these, nor do I really want to. One, you know, I have two, two problems with that. One is, I feel it's kind of an injustice a little bit to this piece. You know, this thing that was loved, and I don't really have a detail of this piece, but all of this work in here is this really, really delicate um, inlay. And on the front piece there, uh, it's got actually some cloth work, kind of uh, varnished in, and just a, some really amazing stuff. And um, so the hand building part of this, the time, that kind of uh, love of labor idea is, is, is definitely involved with this. And the other problem is that clay shrinks again, right? 12, 13%. Well, if I took a mold, it wouldn't ever fit the original wood casing. So I have to make everything 12% bigger or 11.57 <laughs> inches bigger, <laughs> if you want to know. But it, it, that's definitely challenging. That's part of what I love about it because how I make the slabs, if I go through a slab roller, if I roll them, or if I throw them out a little bit more, they shrink more or less depending on how you make them, so that's kind of a pain. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about something else or just kind of branch off here a little bit. And I, I don't have too many more left, um, but I do. I kind of want to focus in on the object because that's kind of where I'm at right now is this idea of the object. Um, these things that I'm including right here, they're kind of more symbolic. Um, some things that are sought after for a lot of people, um, the idea of the World Cup, um, something that could be shown off, um, the object as kind of a trophy, or the object, you know, being um, a symbol of something. The actual object itself, um, you know, maybe maybe there's reproductions of it, um, not just one thing. And it's interesting how an object um, becomes kind of the focus of this whole idea. And I'm kind of interested in, in that. There's kind of that one side of it. Um, then there's this other side where this is a moon rock. And the rock itself is, is you know, it's not that pretty. It's not like uh, made of gold or anything special like that. It, didn't, it wasn't made by a skilled person or anything like that. Um, but yet it's a very, very valued object. And uh, I kind of am very interested in wondering why that is. And as I go through here, I'll kind of touch upon that a little bit more. As opposed to this, which is this kind of old nautical pulley, well, a lot of people really could care less. I, I, this is kind of where I'm interested in, in, in. I'm wondering, you know, where has this thing been? Where did it come from? Um, I think a lot of it developed from, oh, here's an, an image of a flutina, an old accordion. I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing that right. It's probably much, much prettier. But this idea, and I think I kind of pick it up from my grandfather. And I used to love going in his barn and discovering all of these things. And he'd always be fixing something and tinkering something and changing something. Um, but nothing was ever broken. And it was made to last. And I, and I think part of my fascination with this certain time period, you know, of around 1900, is, is that kind of idea that um, nothing is really seen that way. And for me, a lot of... Uh, my work is kind of, um, it's kind of a, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to validate or remember this certain time period. These certain people that um, in my life that really all we have of them or all that's really passed down is these objects. We have some images, um, but images to me are very detached. Um, I can't touch it, I can't move it, I can't bang it. So I kind of feel this very, this, it's almost like it's in this different world. Well, when I actually have the object, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very connected to it. And so I like that idea of the object. And, and that's really kind of what's important to me right now. Um, so walking through my, my grandfather's uh, barn, he, he uh, owned an orchard. So we had just a ton of these things. And I kind of feel like these objects have a life. 
and I feel very um, very nostalgic with them. Yeah. Um, this is kind of an image uh, that I'm really drawn to. It, it it kind of solidifies a lot of kind of the, the thought process I have here. And there's a few images here, um, all by Lewis Hines. Um, kind of talking about this time period, it, and he, he was kind of focused in on this this period. Here's another image of him. The idea of dirt and um, blue collar, you know, being being really into the work, almost putting everything you have into that work. Um, of course, now he his shots were a lot about child labor. He was hired to do this big um, <coughs> exposure of child labor in the country, but and that's interesting, but not as interesting for me. And you've seen some of these great shots, I think, you know, and they're very interesting and intriguing. It's like, why? Incredible. What, what are these people thinking? You know, especially this guy. <laughs> what, what are you doing? How much are they paying you, honestly, you know? And now we laugh. It's like, that would be crazy. But back then, it's like, yeah, let me, I'll do that. And he loved it, I bet. You know, went home, was very excited about what he was doing. I feel that's lost now, and I... I feel very kind of sad in a lot of ways there. I feel like a lot of times for me, I don't fit in in a lot of places kind of for that reason. And I'm wondering why this interests me and this one does not. <laughs> right? I mean, what is it about this? Where's, who wore this? You know, do they play professional? Do they, you know, I mean, I have a thousand questions for this person or for this glove. It never answers. But. <laughs> Same idea here. Washing machine in 1902, and these. You know, no interest for me. It's it's a, it's a it's almost. I mean, I have one of these in my house. I'm not going to use that one because my clothes wouldn't get clean. But uh, <laughs> as far as the object itself, there's nothing there. It's it's a waste as far as the object and the life. And I wonder when is it that an object um, becomes precious. Is there a certain time that has to, to, to live? You know, is that a hundred years? Is it ten? Does the maker of that object have to have died? Or is it that they stop making that object? Or does it have to appear on Antique Roadshow? <laughs> or, you know, what, when is it that I define that this thing is, is a special object? And I have no interest in a lot of things. You know, a lot of it is the wood, the handmade object that I'm interested in. The love that somebody had once put into this thing. And that love that's been passed on for a long time. I mean, to think that I'm handling something that was once love um, when it was made is very special to me. Especially this thing that's meant to deteriorate or not last forever. Craftsmanship is a big deal, I think, for me. I mean, as far as not in my own work or students' work, but as far as what I'm interested in. And more than, I guess, craftsmanship, it was just, for instance, somebody could have made something very poorly, but this love that was poured into it and this time, that might carry some weight with me. Yeah. But again, why does this boot interest me and that one not? <laughs> you know, I don't know. This has a story I could care less. In fact, I'll, I'll like buy these and try them on and, <laughs> you know, I like want to wear them. <laughs> and I end up with like, blisters and uh, here's one more um, and I at this point I just wanted to bring up the idea that when I make these pieces it's a real loss of love for me and it's really actually pretty hard and this is some of the criticism I get is well if you really love these things so much or you really care about these objects how can you destroy them because I am in a way I'm, I'm deconstructing this object and when I do that, I look and sign, and this, this guy has his signature, or this woman has their signature in there. And I can see them. I can see their miscut leather straps and where they, their glue was not perfect. And, you know, all of these things that they've done by hand, and then I'm taking out the billows and pulling out the musical reeds and all of those things. You know, these finely cut wood reeds that were carved. And, uh, yeah, it's true. It's true, I, I do. But in a way, um, this is kind of my balancing act, in a way I'm kind of preserving them or bringing light back to this thing um, that once was now, I think, dying. And I feel that all of these things are dying. 
And so in a way, I'm kind of preserving them. And to be honest, I still have all of the parts just, just <laughs> taking space in my studio, but um, I don't know. I can't, I can't seem to get rid of them. Uh, here's a detail of this piece. This piece is in Taiwan right now, actually. Let's see what they think of it. This is kind of just talking about that same thing I was mentioning. Um, you know, this 2,000-year-old redwood cut a hole so that people could get excited about driving through it. Uh, this man, this man's interaction with this thing that really is amazing. And of course, you know, you could you could value these things differently. And a redwood is obviously an amazing thing. And, um, but uh, it's just kind of this alteration on it and what it where the value lies with that as far as altering it. Some people think it's the greatest thing ever to drive through a tree. This is one of my more recent pieces. Uh, I'm kind of bouncing in the middle here a little bit about you know bringing these old things and this uh, this storyline a little bit back to it. Um, I felt they started to get a little bit lighthearted and I kind of like the darker side of them or at least the little heavier content. So I'm gonna try this out. I don't know how many there are. 70 or something. There's a little detailed shot. So it's got these metal pulleys in with the ceramic pieces. Yeah, they're meat hooks. That were, I like the meat. I like the meat um, factory. It, they're a pain to clean. You can even see here. I got some because these are all greasy and oily. And so putting them together, <laughs> it's kind of a pain. I like it difficult, I guess. Yeah, every time I show it, it's different. And it's in the, it's in March, it'll be in the Grossmont um, Viewpoint Show, and um, they asked me how, what were the dimensions. So I just made a number up. It, I'm sure they'll be like, wait, no, he said it was 42. I have a really hard time um, looking at old work, a really hard time. So um, a lot of the work you've seen is gone, and it's just uh, broken over my knee. I, ha I can't seem to deal with looking at old stuff and I've walked into galleries and picked pieces up and walked out and <laughs> gotten in trouble but uh, <laughs> you know I, I was tired of looking at it so I, I kind of feel this need to move on and change and, <laughs> and uh, some of them I sell and I really like that idea I like that somebody likes it and they want it and I sold an accordion um, you know, but it's not, I guess at this point, um, I teach. So I kind of have this supplemental thing that I'm not as concerned, and it gives me a lot of freedom. You know, I don't, I really don't cater to anybody. And I mean, you saw the pieces, I mean, am I going to sell the piece with lard and cow blood and, you know, I did another piece with, I don't know, 780 gallons of water and, I mean, who's, who's going to buy that? <laughs> I'm not. I'm, uh, I don't have any molds anymore. They're, I mean, they might be around somewhere, but I'll give them away or break them. Or, um, and that was a big. That was always a big point for me to get rid of molds, so I would move on to new things. There was a few in the house that uh, were broken, not by me. And I don't. I'm, I mean, I kind of like them. I can't duplicate them. There was a problem. And then I realized, well, why am I holding on to this thing? Just kind of taking up room. You know, I'm really not a. a a ceramics fiend. I just uh, I enjoy the medium because of what it can do. I like the fragileness of it. You know, I like that quality that it's fragile, and as soon as somebody discovers it's clay, that fragile feeling they get, it's that step back. I like that kind of quality too. It's a very important part of the pieces. I've had two experiences with galleries. That um, uh, one, actually, I was in undergrad selling work, and. Um, you know, I graduated and I still had this gallery, not making very much money. I mean, every now and then I'd sell a three, four hundred dollar kind of piece, which for me was really good, but um, just kind of got by. I mean, I always think I was young enough and in school, you know, kind of bouncing around. And school was a big part of it, a big chunk of time. The other gallery experience I had was I was actually making work that I liked um, and I wanted to put out there, and I actually sought out a gallery. Um, and then I wanted to change what I was doing, and the gallery didn't respond very good to this new stuff. It wasn't going to be very sellable and marketable, you know, hence lard and whatnot. And, um, you know, so I said, okay, well, that's fine. You know, if, I, if anything comes up, I'll let you know again. 
you know, but I could do that kind of thing. And I, and I, um, I think that's just the path I chose, you know. I mean, I, I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy it, but uh, I don't know how I would do without it. I, I would definitely have to, to cater, I think. And I would give up something. Um, I guess what I giving, would be giving up is freedom. Freedom to explore new things. I would be uh, a little bit more f under the fear. You know, fear of income and money and how does that work. Actually, it was a, an old instructor said, you know, find out what you want to do and then find a way to make money out of it. And I thought, well, that's, a good, that's a good advice. Um, I don't know if it'll work, but um, I'll try it. And so uh, teaching was a very valid thing, and I, I sought that out really early. I mean, I was in high school, and I, yeah, I, I love to teach high school. And once I got to college, I thought, screw, screw high school. <laughs> <laughs> I said, college is where it's at, and I, um, yeah, I, I've always really wanted to do that, but and it allows me to do my own work. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I really have a lot of respect for that idea. You know, I've I, I worked for three production potters and I've seen what they do. Some of them, you know, they have a really good good gig, but they make the same thing. Right. You know, and, and maybe I think there's a, a balance where there's a point where you can do that and do your own stuff. Um, a lot of them, they hire people out. So they got big enough where they just say, okay, make these, and I'm gonna try these new things over here. <laughs> And that worked out pretty good. They made they did pretty well. So maybe that's an idea. I can't really speak to that. Have you been um, as a teacher, have you been influenced or learned from your students that has then taken your art or you in no, a no, no, direction? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean of course, definitely. I teaching, I mean it's incredible how much you learn when you teach. Always, always something new. In fact, I love going to like a painting critique, I'm just hanging out and listening. It's like, oh, that's really a good point. And I bring everything back. I have a tape recorder and like eight different notepads. And I'm always like, note to self. And I you know, <laughs> say something, oh, I need to remember this because I'll forget it. And um, I do that all the time. So yeah, I get, get it from everywhere, especially these students and classroom stuff. Sure. So maybe with this piece, instead of a chocolate, maybe <laughs> another venue would be to, after the show, have people take their aggressions out and throw it and break it. Yeah, maybe. As a yeah, alternative. It's usually like a spur of the moment thing. Maybe I'm in a bad mood or... I'm, it's like when I have a new idea, the old ideas are done. And so I'm kind of, I'm moving on. Like right now I have five pieces that I'm just kind of juggling. And I kind of work in that way so that I don't get sick of working in any one way. So at least I can get a little bit out of a little bit of a, a phase that I'm in. Yeah. All right, now I have a close ringer that I'm trying to fi fit finalize. And I got a little out of, out, of, out of my league, I think. But I'm re replacing all of the metal pieces in the close ringer. There's like 26 little pieces, including like a spring. And, um, and they all have to be that 12 point five nine percent bigger and then I'm gonna put it all back together and it's just it's kind of difficult we'll see maybe the next faculty show <laughs> uh, anything else well thanks for coming <laughs>